Good morning. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And maybe we did not really think much about that until the last couple of months, but it's a joy and a privilege to welcome everyone this morning to worship, whether you are seated in the pews or you are viewing online or by tight delay. It's a, just a, a wonder to see you all. Um, when Pastor Ellen and I arrived in March, we saw just a couple of folks, and now we're able to see far more many of you. Uh, I'm Pastor Ernest, and it's a joy that we all come together in the Lord's house to worship. I want to express uh, my appreciation on behalf of the staff and everyone uh, among the leaders for your, um, your presence and for handling the, uh, um, the challenges we have with masks and other arrangements. Um, there, we've had a couple of comments about whether this is a good idea or not. And I, one, of the, one of the biggest responses I guess I've had lately is that in the past, firstly, Calvary's had lots of appearances in the media, local media, for various reasons. And we really don't want the church to appear in the media because of an outbreak here or someone who contracted the disease having come to worship. That's just not the kind of PR that we really need to share at this time. So I thank you for the, you bearing along with the inconveniences of the, what it takes to be here. I am thankful, though, because we have been able to work out some of the kinks. So as you all are here in the sanctuary, as we have more and more people attend, we still have plenty of room uh, for many others to be seated here in the sanctuary. I think that the number is around 110, 11 or so, um, according to our current uh, guidelines that still allows us a certain number of people to be in the church in the fellowship hall and a certain number of people to be in the gymnasium. And the kinks I assured that we've been able to work out is the live stream has now been corrected. And earlier today, the service was live stream. Uh, so if you were here uh, at 8.30, you were seen at the 8.30 service. And if you're home now and you're at 8.30, you'll see yourself, which could be kind of a surreal experience maybe. But... <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm thankful because uh, your staff and your elders and deacons and trustees have been very diligent finding ways that we can move back into a rhythm of worship and patterns that we're used to. And so I wanted to give a word of thanks to everyone for that. Also, if um, this coming week we have several committees that would be meeting, and if you would like to meet at the church, uh, you are welcome to do so. Please call in. Because just like we are going to do after this service, here in the sanctuary, there's going to be a complete wipe down. Uh, we're asking people to go in and out one exit only just to ease the cleanup process as well. So bless you. Before and after um, committee meetings, um, we're asking, we need time to clean up. So that's why we need uh, committee chairs, if you would, to call in and, and set your time in the room with uh, Sarah Denny. I also wanted to mention Sarah Denny because she is, and her family, they're moving on to Washington State, as maybe you saw in the review a week ago. And so we are giving her a small celebration. If you would like to pass on a card or a gift card, uh, we'll have a little celebration with staff on Tuesday. Um, and um, so please be in prayer for the Denny family and that tra transition that they have. Um, this morning, we are doing things slightly different. Uh, again, we're trying to mitigate the amount of transmission. Um, we have the benefit of lots of science that's informing us why we are doing certain things. And ironically or sadly, one of the, the most profound transmitters is when we sing. So intentionally what we're asking is, if you do sing, please wear your mask. Um, but we're only having one congregational hymn and that will be the third hymn, our closing hymn, which is Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, we will sing the doxology, which is right before that. But the refrain, the, path, the benediction response, will also be shown on the screen. It, it, it comes from the first hymn, so we'll be teaching you that song. Uh, so please feel free to sing uh, the benediction response at the end of the service. Um, also, what you'll notice, along with what we've done in the broadcast services, we are trying to incorporate as many staff members who have been involved because I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for you to connect with members of the staff, pastors and programming staff, uh, because you miss them, as we all miss you. Um, so thank you for, again, the, uh, how you are working through these inconveniences 
And we pray that soon that we'll not have these inconveniences and that um, this virus will have, we have found a, a vaccine, we'll find a prohibitive way to not carry it, and this will not be a concern. But our purpose here is to glorify Jesus Christ and to center ourselves around him, for he is not just the word of God, he is the living word. And so friends, let us celebrate this day, this Trinity Sunday, that we remember that God is one God in three persons and three persons in one God. Let us worship God. Well, would you join me for our call to worship this morning? Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns.
The almighty and ever-living God gives us grace by our confession of faith so that we can draw near to the Trinity in all of its majesty and know the love and fellowship that God shares with us. But sin hides us from knowing this love on our own and the ability to share it with others. Let us confess our sin together and individually using the words that will be provided on the screen as we draw near to God's throne of grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, your holiness is complete. One God in three persons. You do not need us, O oh God, but we desperately need you. We call upon your name, but we do not call to seek your will. We prefer our own willfulness. Open our hearts, free of that which lays most heavily upon our souls. Redirect our longings so that our hearts would break after the very concerns which break the heart of our Savior. Empower us through your mercy to breathe into us the fresh wind of your Spirit. Then we will behold the needs before us and respond in your power and grace. Hear us, we pray, as we continue our confession in silence. Friends, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. This is why we say amen through him and to the glory of God. It is God who puts his seal on our hearts through the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. In Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are redeemed. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, First and Calvary kids. We are going to do our children's time a little bit different today. We are gonna let everybody stay in their seats just to keep us safe and keep us all healthy. But I would love it if you're in the pews or if you're at home, if you could give me an air high five. Can I have an air high five? Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, the next few weeks, we are going to be talking about something called the Beatitudes that Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter five. And the Beatitudes actually means blessing. And a blessing is favor that God has on our lives. He blesses our lives. Now here's the thing. A lot of times God's blessing may not look exactly the way you think it should. Might not be exactly what you want, but guess what? It's always what you need. Okay, now the Beatitudes kind of help us know how to live like Jesus. So instead of a me attitude, it's called the be attitude. Get it? Okay, so we are going to look at Matthew in chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Now, this is when Jesus lived on the earth, okay? And Jesus saw the crowds and he sat up on a mountainside and he called his disciples. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now let's talk about what it means to be poor. Now, sometimes if you're poor, it might mean maybe you don't have a lot of money or a lot of stuff, but it could also mean maybe you do a poor job of cleaning up your room, right? Yeah, it kind of has a couple different meanings. And so when we say that we're poor in spirit, that means that we're saying, you know what, God? Without you, I can't really live a Christian life. I'm poor and I need you and I need your help. And it kind of reminds me, I'm going to have my assistant get the glass over there. It kind of reminds me when you're poor in spirit, 
of this glass and it's empty, okay? So it's empty and it, it needs to be filled up. Can you get me the black bag over there and bring it over here? So it's empty and you're saying, God, I'm poor in spirit and I need your help. And so when we say that and we recognize that God needs our help, what he does is he comes and he fills us up. Can you stand up, please, assistant? My assistant lives in my family, so she can, she can be closer than six feet today. So Jesus pours us up just like this orange juice, and he gives us the kingdom of heaven. And you know what's amazing? He gives us the kingdom of heaven here on earth while we're here on earth because he'll come and we have his presence, and he lives in our heart. But then he also gives us the kingdom of heaven forever. We get to live in heaven forever in his kingdom. And that's pretty amazing. So today, when we think about being poor in spirit, we are blessed because we have the opportunity to have a be attitude instead of a me attitude and have the kingdom of God, right? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, We come to you today and we confess that we are poor in spirit. We need you. We need your help so that we can live the life that you've called us to live. We thank you that when we are poor in spirit, we have your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. With hearts and minds in be attitude, listen now for the word of the Lord from Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what's right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and does no evil in his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent, He who does these things shall never be moved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A newlywed couple returned from their honeymoon. This is a story that maybe has been told many times because it was from a generation in which um, in the household, the wife was always making the dinner. That's not always the case now. But in this story, this couple, they returned from their honeymoon and the wife, the new bride was all excited because she was going to make dinner for her in-laws for the very first time. And she wanted to make this incredible impression upon her new in-laws. So... They were invited over, and, um, and the preparations were taking place. And bride is in the kitchen, and she's seasoning this wonderfully marbled piece of steak. And salt, pepper, all the different things you put on before you cook the steak. And then just before she puts it on the fire, she t- cuts off about a quarter or even a third of one end of the steak and then puts it to the side. The new husband who wants to make sure he does not create an encounter that will be repeated over and over and over for probably the next 50 years, wants to make sure that he asks a question and not makes a statement. So he asks the question, honey, um, why do you cut that last piece of steak off? And she said, quite defiantly, well, my mother taught me to do it that way. So they have this wonderful meal, husband is still, and, and they have this they have coffee and dessert, and sure enough, the new bride, she thinks, you know, I need to call my mom and say, hey, mom, why, you know, the way you taught me how to cook that piece of steak, how, why did you teach me to cut off the last third? You know, that's funny you asked me, honey, because that's the way your grandmother taught me to cook it as well. 
So the next day, the two of them, they said, let's call grandma and check in with her and see where she got this whole idea from. So grandma is on the, at the turn after the ninth hole and taking a break. And so they, they agreed after grandma finished her round of golf, they were going to go have a, a coffee or dessert somewhere else as well. So the three of them get together and they exchange, exchange pleasantries. And then sure enough, the, the mother, uh, uh, the daughter of the grandmother asked her mom, Hey, Mom, um, your granddaughter was asking me about the way that we've always learned to cook a steak. Why did you always cut off the last third of that steak before you cooked it? Well, you know, your great-grandmother taught me to do it that way. So all three are perplexed. And they say, okay, let's take a road trip. And they head out to the senior nursing care facility where great-grandma is cared for. And um, the three enter into the room, knock on great-grandmother's door, and she nods, and she's been kind of napping. She's got a little oxygen going on. She's got the TV turned on. And so grandma walks up to great-grandma and says with a very determined voice, Mother, yes, do you remember the way that you taught us to cook a steak? Yes. Why did you teach us to cut off the last third of that piece of meat? Great-grandmother, she straightens up her place and she can speak more clearly. She clears her throat and she said, my husband and I, your great-grandfather and I, we did not have much. And it was during the depression, you know, and we didn't have much to deal with. So all I had was this little pan and all three younger generations look at each other in astonishment because they realized they had been doing the same thing over and over without ever asking why. Friends, we are going to read through and study the Beatitudes and we're going to look at them Beatitude by beatitude. And I love how, uh, Sarah, you shared that, not the me attitude, but the be attitude. So that we have a strong, stronger sense of how God is teaching us to be disciples much more deeply attuned to the manner and purpose of Jesus Christ. Let us hear God's word as we turn to the first three verses of Matthew chapter 5. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Commentators, when they look at the Beatitudes, they see this list of attitudes for Christians uh, in two main ways. They look at it either as the culmination of all of Jesus' earthly teaching, all the things that he lived out. We we see each of these Beatitudes lived out through Jesus. And so then there's a second school that says, okay, let's expand on that. If that's a summation of what Jesus did, then is that not a summation of how God is teaching us to be followers of Jesus Christ? So line by line, we're going to look at each one of these. And today, I want to look and give particular attention to this first beatitude because it has a lot to do with what the session is working with right now. At our last session meeting, we talked about this season of transition. People like to hurry and think that the whole purpose of transition is to find a pastor. In our session meeting, we talked about four steps in which the last step leads us to that point. But 
before we think about what kind of pastor the church is looking for, we begin looking at what kind of a disciple is first in Calvary trying to equip to live out God's ministry through this congregation, through this community? What is the goal that this session has for equipping disciples, not just to create future leaders, to sustain a ministry at the corner of 820 East Cherry and Harrison, but much more so, how are we creating disciples, followers of Jesus Christ? So then before we get to that, what kind of systems, what kind of a spirit, what kind of a tone, what kind of stewardship is in play in a congregation that equips individuals to become disciples like I was speaking of? But before you even get to talking about what kind of tone, what kind of stewardship is evident in a congregation, what kind of spiritual leaders, what kind of elders, deacons, trustees are going to be needed to inspire and, and lead people in the way towards a congregational identity focused at equipping disciples in that particular way? So we have spiritual leaders, we have the environment or the, the tone of the congregation, and then we have the disciple. So that we have all that. So then what kind of pastor, what kind of shepherd is going to motivate, is going to help a session, the governing body of a congregation, discern how to be strong pastoral leaders, spiritual leaders, how to create an environment that exhibits the kingdom of God that reveals the peace, the power, and the presence of Jesus Christ that then equips disciples that serve in this community and even all over the world. So therefore, that's why the next couple of weeks we're going to be talking about some Beatitudes that talk about how is our attitude that of Jesus Christ. So in Matthew 5, before we even get to the word blessed, there's a very important word that we often skim over. And we, we read the word as see, as in Jesus saw the crowds. But the Greek word is really much deeper, much more engaged than just passively seeing. You know, I can see that there's a window back there that has a textured uh, surface to it. I can see the, the colors in the mosaic, in the St. Paul mosaic right here. But the word here is beholding. There's a depth of engagement as Jesus, he looks in the valley at the mountainside and he sees the people hurting. He sees their longing. He sees their hunger, their spiritual hunger. They see the longing that they have for God to reveal God's good and gracious power. So Jesus beheld the power, the, Jesus beheld the people and their needs. And I think there's an interesting parallel that, to take note of this. Jesus is giving his new law on the mountain just in the same way that Moses received the law of God in Exodus. And so Jesus is fulfilling what we see that, that God gave uh, Moses and Moses gave the people. But Jesus He's beholding the need. He beholds the hunger, but he doesn't turn to the people first. What does he do? He turns to the ones he's instructing, the ones he's equipping. Because they are, that, those first century disciples, they, we are them. And we are the benefactors of their stewardship, of their faithfulness. We are the benefactors of God's Holy Spirit being blown afresh in us and renewed every day. So Jesus, whether the first century or 21st century disciples, he is equipping us as we look at these beatitudes. Did it surprise you, though, that Jesus didn't look at the people? Don't assume, though, that Jesus did not have empathy just as Moses brought the law down, Jesus is sharing with the people these beatitudes. And he's empowering you and me to teach and preach with integrity 
Because each of us, we have seen, we have beheld a whole lot of stuff within the last two weeks, both as those who have observed things around the world with coronavirus, the the effects of the virus here in Springfield, we have beheld the pain that, that around the world, people are marching in protest over the death of George Floyd. We are beholding the anguish that our entire people are sharing in a way that we have not heard, many of us, I had not heard as clearly as we've been hearing lately. We all have been beholding. And friends, that is not easy, but that is what Jesus calls us, how he calls us to engage. So then if we are beholding, how are we blessed? Kenneth Bailey, in his commentary, he says that it is not a conditional. It is not that if you do this, you'll be blessed. Jesus is saying, I am here, therefore, you are blessed. Because Jesus has initiated in Matthew 5, the new kingdom. Kenneth Bailey, he goes on to say that we live in the interim period between the inner the inauguration of the rule of the kingdom of God and the future coming of Christ in victory. And our role in living out our salvation is living out the struggle of beholding, being emptied, and being poured poured into our empty vessels the spirit of God who equips us, who challenges us to take risks, to be Christ where Christ appears absent in the world today. The kingdom erupted first by Jesus beholding our human condition. He understood that we all suffer from one common virus, and that is the affliction of sin. But he he shares and reminds us, we need not wait to be blessed because the condition of blessedness has come upon us in his incarnation. So maybe I need to ask, have you felt poor in spirit? Have you felt emptied yourself, whether the things that you've seen on the media or the the inconveniences that you feel? And we've been trying to be very consistent that whoever is speaking uh, doesn't wear the mask, but even us who are up here, we're wearing a mask. And I can tell you, when I was doing the, uh, reading the corporate prayers, my, my, my glasses would fog up. And it was hard for me to even read the paper in front of me. It was inconvenient. We are so blessed, friends. Um, An organization that Pastor Michael introduced you to last February, the Outreach Foundation, is an organization I'm very familiar with. And one of their recent videos from about a year ago, um, one of their leaders, Marilyn Borst, took a team of eight Presbyterian ministers to the Middle East. I think it was to Lebanon, maybe Syria. And they they filmed a short video, a short live video of the worship service. The, The congregation, the sanctuary was a beautiful building. But to go to worship, you had to go past the threats of being bombed or walking over an IED or something that was laid to prevent people from gathering. And so because of that dynamic, that church had not seen a pastor, a minister of the word and sacrament for years. And suddenly this team from the Outreach Foundation came with eight Presbyterian ministers and they helped as a team officiate and lead the Lord's Supper. And people are taking their handheld handheld devices and filming it and you can hear the tears, you can hear the sighs and the moans because the people just wanted a pastor. They just wanted a pastor to read the scripture and pray over them. We have inconveniences, but praise God, we have been spared from so many more. And I pray that the inconveniences we experience today will prevent us from further inconveniences in the future. God is doing incredible work in our midst. 
In his power, Jesus cured. He gave the opportunity for each one of us to know his power. But we need to remember the good news, friends, as empty as we may feel. We never will ever experience the emptiness that Jesus Christ experienced on our behalf. I mean, think of it, Jesus being fully divine, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and then in his incarnation, he became human. He condescended and became a human being born of a virgin. He was, he, he was born as a baby. He lived into adulthood, and he preached the gospel, and it inaugurated the kingdom of God, the kingdom of blessedness. Falsely accused, he was crucified. He died. He was buried. God resurrected him. In his death, Jesus emptied himself of his divine nature so that he would fully experience death, a death that you and I would never have to experience. And in the power of the Father, he is raised and resurrected. He appeared before his disciples and he ascended so that right now when you and I pray, when you and I share our emptiness with God, when you and I talk about the longings that we have for someone that we love or people who are oppressed, Jesus Christ, he is mediating our prayers and perfecting our prayers to the Father to the very side of the Father. How are we beholding? This is the uh, the beatitude that Jesus calls us to. We need to begin by beholding a couple of things. We need to behold the presence of God even in the midst of what seems like godlessness. We need to affirm that God is here even in our midst just as Jesus came in the midst of all the cries of those down the hillside from him. We are called to behold, to see and cast the vision, for indeed that this is the day the Lord has made so that you and I would reveal God's power and peace. Jesus is also calling us to behold those who are suffering. We've talked a little bit about that already. But more importantly, friends, I believe that God is calling us to behold ourselves. How can we speak with integrity about what God is doing unless we search our heart, unless we open our heart to the very need that we have that only God can fulfill? The psalmist says in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. God sent his son so that he would behold the people, so that Jesus would instruct, that he would equip his disciples, that he would equip us. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that you and I would be continually blessed and poured into with that fresh breath. We're not just doing things over and over again just because we always did it. God's mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness never ends. All this beholding, it's another example of how God works to bring a convergence. I talked about last Sunday how the little boy showed up at the feeding of the 5,000 and he took his lunch, his snack box from Popeye's or, or uh, Captain D's of his two fish and five loaves and handed it to Andrew. And Andrew gave it to Jesus and Jesus handed it over to five or 15,000, depending upon how you read that text. In the book of Acts, There's this character named Saul, and he is on the road. He is going to put a stop to this thing called the way or followers of Jesus. We weren't even called a church at that point. And then Jesus encounters Saul, who we will know later as Paul. And Jesus also appears in a vision to a man named Ananias. In the midst of Ananias praying, God appeared to Ananias in a vision and said, Ananias, I have a job for you. Yes, Lord, what is it? I want you to receive your enemy in your household. 
Now, wait a minute, Lord. Did I hear that right? I want you, Ananias, to receive Saul because I have sent him to your home. God, why are you sending this evil man to my house? I have sent this man to your house and you will bless him. Ananias is beholding the face of the Lord. Ananias is beholding this person who he did not know. And he is beholding himself and he continues to pray. And then he opens himself up to God's will. And Ananias becomes a very significant part of the narrative that becomes the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Beholding means having the courage to look deeply at those areas within us we prefer not to acknowledge. Oswald Chambers shares, the knowledge of our own spiritual poverty is what brings us in the right proper place where Jesus accomplishes his work. Beholding not only causes us to acknowledge our own poverty, it, it calls us to acknowledge the poverty of those around us and the great abundance of the one whom we worship. When we behold, we begin answering the question, why do we do what we do the way we do it? Is it about ourselves? Is it about making disciples? Is it about being a disciple? Is it about beholding the face of the Lord? I'm thankful because we're going to be talking and tackling some of these questions as a session. But I think it's also appropriate that we, as, as we gather and worship, that we pray, asking God to discern those questions. How indeed is God using us as we're hopefully looking at the end of a pandemic? How is God using us as we are in the shadow of a, a major regional university and other significant schools of higher education? How is God calling us to behold, not only here, not only our navels, but how is God calling us to behold that which God brings to our attention? In the last couple of weeks, God has given us many opportunities to think about why we do what we do the way we do it. Why are we here, even as some are fanning us on a warm day, it's summertime. We're here to give thanks for the surpassing glory of God who continues to blow afresh in us that which we can never do for ourselves and that which we could never hold only for ourselves, but is meant to be shared and extended. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in response to the word of God and the gift of faith that we have been given, Will you please stand and say with me the words from the affirmation of faith from Eco's essential tenets of the Reformed tradition. We are elected in Christ to become members of the community of the new covenant. This covenant, which God himself guarantees, unites us to God and to one another. Already in the creation, we discover that we are made to live in relationship to others, male and female, created together in God's image. In Christ, we are adopted into the family of God and find our new identity as brothers and sisters of one another, since we now share one Father. Our faith requires our active participation in that covenant community. Thank you. Please be seated. In our prayers this morning, we also extend prayers for Jerry Sweeney. Uh, he's been hospitalized. And we also pray for Mary Thill, 
Um, a message has gone out that she had a heart attack, and so please pray for Mary and Bob um, for Mary's uh, strengthening and recovery. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy are you, O God, our Father, giver of all good things. From your home on earth and from your great power and mercy, we give you thanks. Holy are you, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross and your rising from death that we may live your resurrected life. O Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, from your abiding presence, our lives are changed and transformed. We are comforted not by what we have done, but by your surpassing glory. O Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We praise you, O triune God, for the fullness of your Trinity. We thank you, O God, that you have withheld nothing from us. O Lord, may we cherish not the limited amount that we have become accustomed to, but may we be blessed by our dependence upon you, that you may fill and quench our spirit, that we may behold even into the darkness of the unknown and affirm that the Lord is my light and my salvation, and I have no need to fear. We pray, O God, for the the family of George Floyd. We pray, O God, for the human family of George Floyd around the world. For there is brokenness, O God, and we pray for healing. We ask you, O God, that you would continue to do that which we can never expect. Though disease, though unrest may happen, you are still God, and you are still transforming us and making us more into the image of Jesus if we but would surrender to your will. We pray, O God, for the safety of those who do protest, that they would do so, and that they would, their message would not be compromised by extremists. We pray, Lord, for millions who seek a cure to this pandemic. We pray, Lord, for those first responders who are standing in our place. O oh, gracious God, continue to give us peace as we discern next best steps for those who are planning fall activities or the academic year or even opportunities to find respite on vacation. Oh Lord, make us still before you that we may be most blessed because we have discerned, we have beheld your presence. We pray, oh God, for this congregation, for this presbytery and the synod that we may all behold Christ in Springfield and beyond, revealing his love and mercy. May what we do be led by your great commission, and may we behold through your greatest commandment to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us, O God, that we may love you by the way that we show that love to one another. Hear us, O God, as we pray for those upon our hearts in silence. Holy God, we lift up to you the Sweeney and the Thill family, and we pray for your comfort and that you bring healing for Jerry and Mary. O Lord, Continue to do your work among us that as we behold you, that we will continue to to tell a story that we would bear witness to your amazing power and love. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, as we prepare our hearts for our offering this morning, there are several ways to give. You can text to give, give online, or through many of the opportunities you will see on the screen if you are worshiping with us at home. If you have joined us for worship in person this morning, we are very thankful, which many of you have, and we are so thankful that you have done so. The offering will be received at the desk, which has been set outside of the church office, and you can drop off your tithes and offerings there. This is the time where we make our love visible through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's give with cheerful hearts. Whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, whether I'm weak or whether I'm strong, whether I'm sure or maybe confused, feeling loved or feeling used, I know a place. Oh, 
Well, you may be seated this morning. Would you join me in our prayer of dedication? Generous God, over and over your grace sustains us. Over and over your love provides for us. Over and over your arm steadies us. We give you these gifts with gratitude and joy. Thankful that you are God over all. Amen. It's such a blessing to worship with you all this morning who are here. Uh, it's good to hear the doxology sung by people. <laughs> Would you join us in singing the final hymn, Holy, 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 stand in body or in spirit as you will. when someone has you over for a meal. But if all we did was see blessings in a small way, because we're not beholden, just think what we are missing out on. Just think what the world is missing out on what is happening with the Holy Spirit at First Encounter. 
Friends, I want you to think about beholding this week. Not only the beholding that you are doing out in the world, the beholding that you are doing within yourself, but the beholding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the work of the Father and the Holy Spirit. We celebrate Trinity Sunday as a reminder that God has held nothing back from us, and so shall we not hold anything back from the world of God's grace. And the grace and peace of God our Father, Jesus Christ, his Son, and the moving of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.